If you are worried you have Lyme disease, or just like the outdoors, and want the peace of mind of knowing whether you have Lyme disease or not, there is a new Lyme screening test based on decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at VCU Medical Center. For more information, visit glymedx.com. That's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X.com. Or email at info at glymedx.com. Infectious diseases, research, medicine, health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Hey everybody, this is Robert, and I appreciate you listening today. And I encourage you to check out the website, OutbreakNewsToday.com, OutbreakNewsToday.com. Now a relatively rare tapeworm has popped up in several patients in Alberta, Canada in the past few years, which may not sound like much. However, the only other human case of this particular parasite in Canada was in 1928. The parasite is called Echinococcus multilocularis, and its appearance in Alberta has caught the attention of some infectious disease specialists. Joining me now is Stan Houston, MD. Dr. Houston is a professor of medicine and infectious disease, disease expert from the University of Alberta. Dr. Houston, welcome to the show, sir. Hi. Uh, nice to talk to you down there. Thank you, sir. I appreciate your time. Um, before we get into this particular situation in Alberta, let's talk a little bit about the parasite. Now, Echinococcus is a cestode or a tapeworm. Um, what are the animal host of this parasite and what's the life cycle? Right. So uh, the, the life cycle in the wild is between canids or members of the dog family uh, in which the parasite takes the form of a, a very tiny tapeworm. Uh, and, and in fact, the canids can, uh, can have a, a very high density of an infection without apparently uh, causing much of a health impact. Um, and the other um, host in the life cycle, uh, uh, the alternative uh, host is, is a rodent. So what, what happens in, in, in the wild is that the, the uh, canid defecates uh, tapeworm ova into the, on the ground or in the environment, and these are consumed by the rodent uh, whenever the rodent, when the rodent is eating whatever rodents eat. Um, but the rodent gets a very different form of disease, a, uh, a, a growth or a mass, uh, almost always in the liver. Um, and then, of course, uh, the, uh, the rodent uh, may, may come to be eaten by, by the fox or coyote, and, uh, uh, and the coyote gets the tapeworm, and, and that's how the cycle goes. What, <clears throat> what goes wrong is when uh, humans uh, in, ingest uh, the ova, and we, in effect, take the place of the uh, rodent in this cycle, except hopefully we're not going to be consumed and pass it on, but we do get, humans get uh, a progressively increasing um, growth or, or, or mass almost always in the liver. And, and how, how do people contract it? So the the likely ways would be either if your dog were to uh, eat rodents and acquire the tapeworm, uh, there there might well be uh, microscopic tapeworm ova on the on the dog's fur, and in the course of petting or handling your dog, uh, and if you weren't meticulous about hand washing, you could ingest ova that way. The the other uh, uh, way would be if you're consuming uh, fresh fruits or vegetables from kind of ground dwelling uh, uh, produce from a garden that's frequented by uh, 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 infected canids, uh, probably dogs or coyotes or, or foxes, 
uh, and then your your uh, you know strawberries or carrots uh, weren't wa washed adequately, then you could get it that way. Okay, and you mentioned uh, 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 the diseases in the liver. Can you uh, elaborate on the pathology? Yeah, well, th this is uh, aside from this being brand new, as you've alluded to, the other thing that makes this of more importance than four cases might suggest is that it's a pretty nasty disease. Uh, it, it grows slowly but progressively um, and can actually spread locally in the liver and even uh, uh, spread or metastasize uh, systemically to, to other organs. Um, and unless you're fortunate enough to catch this um, process early enough that it can be totally excised and still leave enough liver behind to get by with, um, then then this disease is is incurable. It, it can be controlled or suppressed indefinitely, and people can live uh, long lives, but they have to take an antiparasitic drug uh, continuously and indefinitely. And how is uh, this particular species of Econococcus treated and diagnosed? So uh, diagnosis would 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 involve, uh, and almost always would start with an imaging uh, investigation that shows um, an abnormality in the liver, and then a biopsy. Um, uh, and in fact, it requires some skill or experience to to recognize this parasite. I'll, I'll tell you that the first case we had here uh, was only uh, definitively diagnosed. Uh, on the after th three biopsies, um, and the second case we had, we actually sent tissue to the to your CDC down in uh, Atlanta, and they were not able to make the diagnosis. So we, we we were able to make it on a on a repeat biopsy. So um, it, it probably there's some sampling error, get, just getting the right. Uh, uh, piece that's representative of the parasite, but also, also um, so, so, some experience in in recognizing it, and and I'll tell you that all, all of our for well we, actually I should tell you that we've just had a fifth case this week. Oh, really? um, uh, all of our at least the first four cases we have collaborated with uh, uh, an expert named uh, uh, Gottman in in uh, Switzerland uh, to do um, uh, serology on these patients and, and a second opinion on uh, uh, PCR, nu nucleic acid studies. And we have a wonderful collaboration with our uh, veterinary colleagues in uh, the other, uh, Alberta's other major university, the University of Calgary at the vet school there. And uh, they actually had uh, identified um, the presence of this parasite in 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 the animal hosts before we ever had our first uh, human case, and they had developed uh, very sophisticated molecular techniques to show uh, that this was actually the European uh, strain of the parasite that has um, has appeared here in Western Canada, and presumably explains why the disease seems to be all of a sudden behaving differently than it used to. All right. Well, let me uh, break for a word from our sponsor. For many years, we have been waiting for a Lyme disease test that actually works. After decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at the Medical Center at Virginia Commonwealth University, a breakthrough test has been developed. The GLD test, recently launched by Global Lyme Diagnostics, is based on Dr. Marconi's science. For more information, visit glymedx.com, that's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X.com, or email them at info at glymedx.com. Okay, let's get back to the uh, questions. Um, you, uh, you just mentioned that uh, it's a Europe, it came from Europe. It's, uh, this particular strain of Econococcus is also found in Russia and China, Central Asia, and some other areas. 
And the only previous case prior to these five is was in Manitoba about 90 years ago. Um, right. Yeah. You, Good how, work. Yeah. How do you believe? There, there, there was one in Minnesota actually in 1976. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and there's another. There's another probably more common uh, species of Aconococcus that's found in uh, North America. And uh, but yeah, it's, so, to, but it's much different, right? Right. Echinococcus granulosus yeah. is endemic uh, in uh, certainly in northern Canada and I guess Alaska, um, m- maybe other parts of the continental U.S. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, fairly uncommon, but but well, uh, we we would see if probably a couple of cases a year here for 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 for, for many years. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and of course, um, it's seen in in immigrants from um, from from other countries, the Middle East, for example. Uh, so that's um, uh, w- well known, uh, not common, but not super rare, and a very different disease, as you as you indicated. Right. Um, well, I guess the question is, how did how did this parasite arrive in Alberta? Well, we 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 no one uh, saw it come in the door, so to speak. But mm-hmm. the, the the most logical explanation is that it came with an imported uh, uh, pet dog. And now, now that it's in the canid uh, population, I, I assume coyotes and foxes. Um, right. Um, it's and rodents. In rodents, is 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 it there to stay now? I can't uh, imagine that we could get rid of it without mm. getting rid of all the right. coyotes and, and, and rodents, which I don't think is possible. It, it's, it's surprisingly, it's very well established, um, a high proportion of coyotes in, and, and in fact, this is another perhaps uh, noteworthy point is, is that, uh, it, right in the cities of Edmonton and Calgary, um, uh, there are p- perhaps several hundred coyotes in each city carrying this infection. Mm. All right. Well, so as an infectious disease doctor, uh, an expert in infectious diseases, how concerned are you? Uh, well, it, it, it's too early to tell is the, is the short answer to that mm-hmm. question. Um you know, maybe, as I said, now we've just had a fifth case, but maybe, maybe this is just about the end of it. But, um, it is, it is, um, it is also possible that this could be, this is, could certainly be considered an emerging infectious disease. Uh, and it's possible that it could, uh, grow substantially, um, because, First of all, the, the 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 point that I mentioned about the high frequency of the uh, in, infection in animal populations close to um, uh, uh, close to human ha- habitation, and and in some um, domestic dogs, uh, means there's the possibility of exposure, um, and secondly, um, I didn't mention, but People who are immune compromised are at increased risk of getting disease with this uh, organism. Um, that's well known in Europe, and um, and of course we have more and more people living with uh, immune suppression for uh, HIV, um, um, trans, uh, transplant patients. Uh, one of our patients was a transplant patient, um, and immunosuppressive drugs for other diseases. So. Um, this certainly it's um, responsible and appropriate to be keeping a for both clinicians and our veterinary colleagues to be keeping a, a, a close eye on this uh, situation. Yeah. Well, I guess the most important question is, um, what recommendations do you have for the Alberta public or or elsewhere, and um, how to prevent this? Yeah, well, I, I guess uh, some of the precautions uh, uh, derive logically from the mechanism of transmission. So if your dog 
theoretically cats as well uh, eat are outdoor animals and and are likely to be running wild enough to eat, eat rodents, then you should be particularly meticulous about um, uh, about, about hand washing after handling your animal. Uh, and if your if you eat fresh produce from uh, a garden where um, canids, uh, wild or even domestic, might might be. Um, frequenting and and perhaps defecating, then you should be particularly careful about washing your your produce. Uh, there's one other um, substantial practical step that people can take if their if their dog might be eating rodents. Deworming the dog on a regular basis uh, would make would make sense, and um, with the caveat that it's important. Uh, to use a deworming agent that is effective against uh, um, cestodes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, as a non-vet, I don't know the everyday details, but I think many deworming agents are just for roundworms, right. and so it would be important to emphasize that the that the product should should be one that's effective against um, cestodes or tapeworms. Doctor Houston, how well is this publicized up in Alberta? Well, we have informed our Department of Public Health, um, and um, they are coming out with a, uh, you know, st a statement to to doctors. Uh, my vet colleagues are circulating this information among the, the, the veterinary colleagues. Um, we actually, are, I'm not sure how you picked this up, but we actually had a. Um, oh, quite a flurry of uh, interest uh, from a number of radio stations and print print media when we when the medical school uh, um, publicized this. So, um, and I know some people must have must have seen it because I got quite quite a few questions and comments as I walked through the hospital. So. Yeah. 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 I, I actually found it first on the University of Alberta website. Okay. Yeah. So is there anything else you'd like to add about this parasite or the situation in Alberta or anything else? Um, no, I think uh, I, I, I think you've well allowed me to, to make most of my uh, the, the points I thought uh, uh, were, were important. Uh, I think uh, uh, vigilance uh, is, is appropriate, but being alarmist uh, is uh, based on what we know today it would, is not appropriate. Great advice. All right. I want to thank you, Dr. Stan Houston, for your time and expertise, sir. I appreciate it. Okay. Thanks very much for your interest, Robert. You're welcome.